Okay, so what is a robot? Here's gonna be our first test of our question. So here's our first example. Is this a robot? Go ahead and pull up your Q&A and let me know what you think. Looks like mostly yeses. Okay, awesome. So yes, this is a robot. This is probably the most common example of what we think of and when we think of robots. Um, this is a robot that usually plays with kids. Um, and let's try another one. What about a laptop? Is a laptop a robot? Some maybes, some noes, some yeses. So um, a laptop is not a robot. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why. So like we're gonna get into here is what's the difference? Why was that first one a robot? Why is a laptop not a robot? So what do robots do? So in order to be a robot, um, it has to do three different things. It has to sense things. So in this case, um, this robot here is looking at this flower and it sees that it's a bright yellow thing that smells nice. So it was able to sense that. Then robots have to be able to think. So in this case, we sensed that it was bright yellow and it smelled nice. And so now we're thinking about what are things that are bright yellow and smell nice. So uh, we can say flowers are bright and yellow and smell nice or lemons are bright and yellow and smell nice. And then they have to act. So in this case, the robot decided that it was a lemon and then decided it was gonna grab the lemon. So clearly we can look at that picture and say this robot was wrong. Um, it is not a lemon, it's clearly a flower. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of walk through how you would design a robot to make good decisions so that it doesn't mess up thinking that our flower is a lemon. Um, and so with Mother's Day coming up um, in next month, we're gonna kind of walk through the scenario of building a robot that has to pick out a flower for our mom for Mother's Day. Okay, so building a robot, picking out our sensors. So sensors are really important um, as far as what the robot can do and why we choose different sensors. So our goal here is to identify the flower. So there's a lot of different types of sensors. So there's color sensors, there's touch sensors, force sensors, temperature sensors, moisture sensors. Um, these are just some really common examples. There are a lot more. There are all kinds of sensors. But what we wanna think about is if we're trying to identify a flower, which one of these sensors or which combination of these sensors are gonna be the most useful? So when a robot starts out, if it doesn't have any sensors, then it has no idea what anything is, right? You imagine that you, can't, you don't have any of your five senses. You can't see, you can't hear, can't touch. You know nothing about what's going on around you. But the second that you have a single sensor, what happens is you'd go from having the whole wide world of possible objects sitting in front of you, you can narrow that down. So when you introduce your first sensor, you go from having an endless possibility of objects to having a certain group of objects. When you add a second sensor, you now go to a smaller group of objects. And then when you keep adding sensors, it keeps going on in this pattern. So you can see the three sensors, again, our subset gets a little bit smaller. And four sensors, we've got a pretty small circle. So you could do that indefinitely. You could keep adding sensors and adding sensors and adding sensors and adding sensors. And your options would get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to a point where you're like, I am 99.9% .9 sure that this object is a flower. But that's not a great way to do it because that makes robots very complicated. And so what you want to do when you design a robot is find the right sensors that take you from an endless set of possibilities down to a relatively small subset in as few sensors as possible. So it's really important that you don't put a ton of sensors on your robot because sensors aren't always perfect. They do make mistakes and it can make things really confusing. If you've got 25 different sensors and you've got four bad readings, it can totally mess up what your robot thinks it's doing. Okay, 
So for our example of picking a flower, um, we're gonna start with a color sensor. So color sensors give data in what's called RGB values, which are red, green, blue values. So those values come in for any reading of a color sensor, you're gonna get three numbers. And they're all gonna be between zero and 255. So in this case, um, a blue object could give us a reading like red 50, green 80, and blue 150. And so in that case, you can see that blue is the biggest of those numbers by and far. So blue is probably gonna dominate that color. It's probably like a blue, maybe a little bit of a green color, but the red is very minimal. So for our example, trying to figure out how to pick this yellow flower, we need to know what a color sensor reading would look like for yellow. So what I'm gonna have you do is we've got these options, um, A, B, C, and D, all with different color sensor readings. And I want you to go ahead and use your Q&A and let me know which one you think would be yellow, A, B, C, or D. All right, um, we're getting a lot of A's, a couple of B's and D's. So let's look at all these. Um, so we'll start at the bottom. So we look at D and we see that we've got a low red value, a medium green value, and a really high blue value. So just like we saw with our example up here, um, we've got a lot of blue and a little bit of green that might be important. So this is probably like a mostly blue, maybe a little bit teal. Option C, um, we've got a high red, a lower green, and a higher blue. So this one's a little bit trickier because we have two higher values. Um, but when we think about what happens when we combine red and blue, we kind of get a purple. So this is probably like a purpley, a bluish purple. We look at choice B, um, very low red, very low blue, very high green. Um, this is pretty much just green. And then option A, we've got a combination of red and green. Um, so that's tricky because we don't really know when we combine red and green, um, it's a weird color combination, but we have a low blue value and looking at the other options, we know this one is probably yellow. And if you think about it on the rainbow of red, orange, yellow, green, we know that yellow is kind of in between red and green. Okay, so option A was our correct for yellow. Down, and if it's a really hard object, it gets a really high force. If it's a really soft object and it just bends, it's gonna get a lower force. So what we decide once we scan for a color is we need to know if we should hit the object with our force sensor. So I'm gonna let you guys uh, pull in on this. So. The thing in front of us is blue. Should we go through and should we use our force sensor on this object or should we do something else if our object is blue? Okay, some people want to use the force sensor, some people want to move on. So in this case, if the object is blue, um, our flower we know is not blue, so I would probably just move on. Um, let's not waste the robot's time. What about if the object is yellow? Should we use the force sensor if the object is yellow or should we do something else? <coughs> to record, Facebook Live isn't working. We were gonna do Facebook Live until co-host started the broadcast, but it's not. Scroll here, so okay. Most people want to use the force sensor. Yes, that is the right answer. If the object is yellow, we definitely want to see if it's a hard object or a soft object. And then what if we're not sure? What if we use our color sensor reading and we get something that doesn't make sense, like we got all zeros? What do we do then? Do we use the color sensor? Do we use the force sensor? Do we do something else entirely? Okay, so somebody said test again. 
Um, some people are saying use the floor sensor. So if we get some readings that don't make sense, um, we could do pretty much any number of those things, but the easiest thing to do is probably just check for another reading. Um, try the color sensor again. It might have just blipped and it made, an, made a mistake and we try again and we might get a good color reading back and then we can make that decision. Okay. So now let's do a little example. So when we're having our robot go through all of this, we have to figure out how likely it is that an object is a flower. So to figure it out, the robot gives each object a probability of being a flower. So probabilities go from zero to one. And in this case, we're saying that if the probability of a flower is zero, then it's definitely not a flower. If the probability of being a flower is one, then it's definitely a flower. But most likely what we're gonna get is a reading that's somewhere in the middle. So if it's a probability that it's a flower is 0.5, then it's like a 50-50 chance. It might be a flower, it might not. So how does our robot go through and assign probabilities? So the probability of it being a flower is the combination of our two sensor readings. So the probability of what color it is plus the probability of how hard the object is. And so in this case, color is more important than hardness. And so it gets more weight. So if the, if the color of the object is yellow, then the probability of color is 0.6. So that's the highest probability it can get just by color. But from there, you have to subtract from your probabilities based on how far away you go from yellow. So you can see on our regular rainbow here um, that if you go from yellow to orange, you subtract 0 0.1. If you go from yellow to green, you subtract 0.1. And it, counts, it adds on as to how far away you move. So if we're, if our object is blue, we can look back at our rainbow here. We know that we're going one, two spots. So we do 0 0.6 minus 0.2 gives us 0.4. So the farther away we go, the less likely it is that it's a flower. For our probability of hardness, we know that soft is good, hard is bad. So the probability of the hardness is a little bit lower depending on if it's hard or soft. So in this case, it's just one or the other. It's 0.2 if it's soft and 0.1 if it's hard. Okay. So now we're gonna try and do some of this on our own. So I'm gonna just move my screen over. Um, so we know that our probability of being a flower is color plus hardness. And what I'm going to have you guys do is we have three objects and I want you to try and calculate the probabilities for each of them. So you can just jot this down on your paper. Um, I don't need you to put in your answers for this one because we're going to go through them, but I want you to try and do the math on your own. So our first object is green and hard. So remember, you can calculate the color from how far away it is from yellow and then your hardness probabilities are here and you're going to add those up to get your probability of being a flower. Object two is red and soft. Same thing, you can calculate the color and then from the hardness. And object three was orange and soft. So I'm gonna give you a minute. I want you to go ahead, uh, grab your piece of paper and your pencil and jot down what you think the probabilities are for these different objects. And then we'll walk through how we did it. Okay, if you're not done, that's fine. Um, I'm just gonna walk through a couple of these examples and show you guys what I got. So for object one, I got a probability of 0 0.6. So it's green, so we go one away from yellow, so we subtract 0.1, our color contribution is 0 0.5, and then it's hard, 
we add 0.1 to that, that gives us 0 0.6. For object two, it's red and soft. I also got a probability of 0 0.6. So red is two away from yellow. So we subtract 0.2 from 0.6, that gives us 0.4. And it's soft, which is 0.2. So we're adding 0.4 for color to 0.2 from hardness, so 0 0.6. Object three is orange and soft, and I got a probability of 0 0.7. So one away from yellow gives us 0.5, and then the object is soft plus 0.2 gives us 0.7. So now our robot has to make a decision. It has three objects, and we need to figure out which one we should bring back for Mother's Day. So why don't you go ahead, you can use your Q&A for this, go ahead and put in what object you think we should pick, object one, object two, or object three, based on the probabilities that we've got. Pretty much everybody is saying object three, awesome. So the higher the probability, the more likely it is that it's a flower. And so we want to pick um, object three. So um, we also see in this case that object one and object two were equal probabilities. And we can talk about this later, um, but I think looking at what we had from those, like the, I think one object was green um, and we can make our own decisions on, you know, do we think these two should actually have equal probabilities? But for now, um, based on the way our robot's thinking, they were equal. Okay. So the last thing that robots have to do is figure out how to act. And so we said we need to pick flower three, so all of our thinking is done. Now it's just a matter of actually moving the robot to pick the flower. So robots have joints, just like people. And so we can think about this in terms of like the types of joints that we have in our arms. So we know our shoulder joint, right, which rotates all around is a ball and socket joint. It's got a little white ball that sits in this little holster and it can spin around in any direction. Our elbow is a hinge joint, right? It only bends in one direction. Our wrists are actually really weird because they kind of, they twist and they go in all kinds of funny directions. So you can do this with your own wrist and see how far you can spin it around. Like you can't actually rotate and spin. There's a point where like you have to flip it. Um, so you can see that wrists are actually really weird joints and robots don't normally have joints that are really similar to our wrists. And then obviously all of our fingers are all little hinge joints. So our robot has a couple of different joints that we can use. So we have four joints over here, one, two, three, and four. And it's got a shoulder, shoulder spins just like our shoulders. The elbow, just like our elbow, it's a hinge joint. The wrist on the robot is a little bit different. The wrist on the robot can only turn. So you can imagine that if you can't bend your wrist this way and it just spins, that's just like what our robot does. And then our robot has two fingers at the end that just close. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use that object that I had asked you to have on hand earlier. Um, and what I want you to do is we need to figure out how our robot is gonna reach for the object. So I'm gonna kind of show you how to do this here, but if you put your object out somewhere in front of you, I basically want you to do a regular, the way you would reach for the object normally, but I want you to go super slow. So if I've got my hand here, it's just gonna be really like painfully slowly. I'm moving until I grab my object. And what I want you to figure out is which joint do you move first? Do you move your shoulder first, your elbow, or like your fingers or your wrist? And then once you've done that and you think you know which joint you move first, you can go ahead and put that in the Q&A. All right, most people are saying elbow or shoulder. So that's perfect, actually, um, because it makes a difference depending on where your arm is set up. So 
in my example here, you can see I've got a table. And if my hand starts below the table, the first thing I need to do is get my hand up above the table. Otherwise, if I move my shoulder first, I'm just running into the table and that doesn't help at all. Um, but if my hand starts, for instance, like above the table, then I might start with the shoulder and then move the elbow and the fingers. But the important thing is that you didn't start with your wrist. You don't say, I'm gonna grab, um, I'm gonna grab this mason jar. The first thing I'm gonna do is open my fingers. No, the fingers come kind of at the end once you get close to the object, but you don't immediately think, open object. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of how our robot's gonna move. It's gonna start either with its elbow or shoulder. And so you can see that what we just talked about in these pictures, that if the robot is just right next to the flower and there's nothing in the way, um, then it can just directly go ahead and reach for the object. It'll probably move the shoulder first and then adjust its elbow. And then obviously it'll close, open and close the fingers when it gets close. But if there's a table in the way, like in this case here, we have to hinge at the elbow first and then we're gonna lift up at the shoulder so we can get up over the table. All right, so that's the end of our robot flower picking example. Um, I'm gonna bring up some more questions of, is it a robot? Um, but we successfully got our robot to find the right sensors to find a flower then use our sensors to interpret the data and figure out which object is most likely to be a flower and which object we should pick. And then we figured out how robots move so that we could pick the flower. So that's just a reminder, robots sense, think, and act. So remember that when we now go into these questions. So we already said, this one is a robot. What about this? Um, so this is a Roomba, but is a Roomba a robot? Go ahead and put that in the Q&A. What do you think? Yes, everybody's pretty much saying yes. So yes, a Roomba is a robot. Um, it does have sensors on it. Its thinking is very simple. The way it moves is actually um, random, but it does have a thinking algorithm, uh, which is just a code. So it does actually do, it does sense, it thinks, and as you can see, it's acting, it's chasing this cat around. <laughs> And what about cell phones? Are cell phones robots? Yes or no? A lot of no's. So, <laughs> um, so right, cell phones are not robots because even though they do have some sensing abilities, like they can tell when you turn them up or down, um, but they don't have any acting abilities. Your phone doesn't get up and do things on its own. Um, so this guy, a robot, yes or no? All right, so we're gonna skip our last two because I am just about out of time. Um, if we have any questions um, that we, I don't know if we have time for questions, but if we do, we can take a couple of questions. Otherwise, that's all I have for robots. Oh, hi, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so my name is Ananya. Um, I'm gonna be taking some of the questions for some of the talks today. We probably have time for about one question, so we'll just do that. Um, and Deanna, that was great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so the first question that I'm going to ask is from Margot. And so she asked, do robots sense the colors by their wavelengths? So um, specifically when the way most color sensors work um, is it does just take an RGB value. And so it's not specifically looking at wavelength, I don't think. Um, but what it does, so I actually have a color sensor on my robot right now. And the way that it takes the readings is they have, actually, I can grab it and show you. Um, <laughs> so this guy right on front here, this is the color sensor. And when I turn the robot on, you can see that it just shines a light 
and it basically takes a reading from this white and it converts it straight to the RGB values. Um, and so your output is actually just RGB, um, regardless of how it gets it. You're just getting those three numbers, red, green, blue. Cool. Right. I think in, in ooh, because of time, we'll probably just cap it there, but we'll send you the other questions and then maybe we can think about trying to post them somewhere else. Uh, Sounds after. good. So thank you so much. Yep. Thank you.